just introduce what I do. I run a social enterprise called Epic Collaborative. For you who don't know what a social enterprise is, I guess to simply put it, it's, uh, it's the middle ground, right, between a charity, an NGO, and a business. You know, so the focus really is in impacting community, but at the same time, we're looking to uh, sustain ourselves as well. So what my organization hopes to achieve, what our vision is, is to make servitude a lifestyle. All right? So what we do at Epic Collaborative is we design and create collaborative platforms for people like you, ordinary people, to impact community in a fun and easy way. So the reason why we emphasize on fun and easy is simply because of this. What we believe is that all, as soon as you walk through that door of servitude, right, as soon as you spend at least just a second going beyond yourself to help someone else, to serve another person, your life will change. So we see that as our mission, to facilitate that, that change, to bring you through that door, whether it be an, an inch or a kilometer, it doesn't really matter to us because that's really what we believe and that's what we believe will change the world. So let me just share with you a little bit about the beginning. So before this house, um, my friends and I, we started a little project in an Orang Asli village, an indigenous community, um, not far from here, about one and a half hours away. And we found out that they didn't have toilets. And surprisingly, that was after the third visit. So it was very strange because we were, we were asking ourselves, how come we didn't realize this in the two prior visits? You know, it turns out we, we all you know, had really, really tight bladders. So, um, so we found out that they didn't have toilet and immediately we, we jumped at the opportunity and said, okay, maybe we can do something about it. Because they lived in brick houses, uh, but yet they didn't have proper toilets. And so we said, okay, maybe can we build you a toilet? Is that okay? And they said, fine. And then we walked out of that house that we were in and we looked around us and, and we saw that the houses weren't painted. Even though they were brick, they were built merely raw brick. And so at that time, um, my friends and I were all very, very cynical and skeptical. Um, I had never done any social work in my whole life. Um, I, I guess I was one of those persons that would just care about myself, um, would just keep to my friends and I guess, you know, enjoy myself most of the time. And nothing wrong with that, obviously. Um, but so I was very, very cynical. I thought, you know, no one's going to care, especially being in Malaysia. Um, we have, you know, people keep saying that the youth in Malaysia, we don't really care. You know, there's this theta upper attitude. And, but what, yet we just put it up online and we said, you know, put it on Facebook and said, um, whoever wants to join us for, uh, to build some toilets and paint some houses. We call it the toilet building project. And we said, it's going to be fun. It might be tiring, but uh, for guys, you'll probably meet some girls and girls, you'll probably meet some guys. It'll be a fun opportunity. And you'll, you know, you, you know people love uh, others that go beyond themselves to help others, right? The sexy thing. So, so we put it up there. And surprisingly, we got 64 people turn out of nowhere to sign up for our, our event. And, and that really opened my eyes. We had an amazing time. We met amazing people, people that I never knew existed. And, and it really opened our eyes to see that you know, there was actually hope out there that people, all of us, are actually hungry to serve. We are hungry to go beyond ourselves. We are hungry to make our own stories, our own legacies. We are hungry to do that, but yet there wasn't many platforms. So next, we went over to another village where we said, let's go build some toilets and let's paint some houses. And we came across this house. And then we looked at each other and said, um, I don't think we can paint this house. You know, it's not going to do anything especially because we found out that there was a man that was staying in there for over two years. And, and so, so there was a lot of questions. Um, you know, how, how come the man was staying in this house? How come no one helped him? How come his village didn't help, help him? How come the government wasn't doing anything about this? How come he wasn't doing anything about this? So there's plenty of questions. So the easy answer really was, okay, this guy needs a house. You know, stop asking questions. But the fact was that what happens, what happens after we build this house? So commonly what we would do, being ordinary people who have no building skills, um, is we go back to the city, we raise some money, we hold a fashion show, we, we do a fundraiser, we pass it over to a contractor, that contractor puts up this house, and we 
wash our hands clean and say that's it. You know, but the, the thing was, we realized that the house was merely just a symptom of a greater cause. And so we said that we wanted to do it ourselves. So you have to understand that at that time, that you have to understand that I'm not an engineer nor an architect. I'm not from the construction industry. Neither was my teammates. Uh, we were, I was a graduate in communications and media management. We had a graphic designer, we had a banker, and a, an accountant. You know, so, so clearly, none of us were experts in this field. But yet, we came up with this crazy idea at that time, and we all laughed at, laughed at ourselves. And we actually thought we would forget about it. And we said, no, we want to build houses ourselves, make it so easy that we can do it over the weekend, because that's the only time that we have. Um, make it a fun activity, like the one we just had. And, um, and, and do it, make it as easy as IKEA furniture or Lego. So that was really like, what? You know, that was really just said in passing, and we just thought we fo we'll forget about it. But somehow the ideas stuck. And we found ourselves just asking many people, you know, um, do you know if there's technology out there or there's, uh, there's a program out there that will allow ordinary people to put up these houses? And we're just asking, and after many months, probably more than half a year, uh, someone agreed to take up our challenge, a developer, and, and they came up with a mock-up, which right now looks, I guess, a little bit like a chicken coop, but it worked. You know, we, we, did, it in, we did it in three days. Um, so basically, this is what we have. Uh, we did it in three days. Uh, we've done 14 houses so far. Um, So, thank you. So, if you can see over at the far left uh, corner, uh, that was the first house that we built. But we did it together with professionals. We had three professional laborers that assisted us. Um, then, I, then we said that, you know, we'll, we'll do it without professional laborers at all. Because the dream for us really was to be able to empower other people who, who stumbled across these houses, whether it be an orang asli person, or another family in need in, rural, in a rural setting, they'll be able to order a house, get it delivered to them, and build it together with their friends over a five-minute YouTube video. And that is still really the dream. Um, and we are slightly closer to achieving that. Uh, we've built 14 houses so far in three days, and we've done it. And this, the, that, this is a special part about Epic Homes. And the special part is really that we've done it together with over 300 different builders, not professional architects or engineers. Some of them are, but very, very little in, in construction background. And, and not only has it uh, changed the way we approach this housing problem in, in rural Malaysia, but at the same time, it provided us an opportunity to show that we care to the Orang Asli people, and at the same time, help in knowledge transfer and, and cultural exchange as well, making the experience so much richer. So then we found out that uh, there are over 82% of all Orang Asli, 80% of all Orang Asli that are in need of housing aid. This means that they're either homeless, living in structurally unsound um, homes, or, um, or living in less than conducive environments. So you can imagine 20 people in a family living maybe in a 400 square feet um, house. So that's the situation that we have in Malaysia. And, and uh, we didn't know about this when we started. We really started with just one house and it was just called Project Epic. It was really just a project and the idea was following that project will go on to, I'll go on to doing, uh, getting a real job. Um, so this is the problem that we, we recently found out. And the reason why we do what we do is because of this, we, we believe in, called the big win, right? That every home, that this is really just, this is an opportunity. It's an opportunity to not only just build houses for the underprivileged, but it's, a, it's an opportunity to bring us together, to bring us closer, to show that there are many people that are willing to go the extra mile to help another person, to help a stranger. And, and we believe that Epic Homes has provided us the answer in terms of not only just putting up these houses, but being able to give hope um, to the people that has lost it. And we believe that hope is what will power the underprivileged to come out from whatever problems that they are facing. 
So here are the five important lessons that I, I've learned along the way. So we started back in 2010, um, January. And so far we've built 14 houses and we are looking at um, possibly 25 houses this year. Um, so the first lesson, lesson in sparking ideas is why a life of servitude? Right, so the reason why I mean, servitude, don't, let me define servitude to you. Servitude is not working seven days a week, uh, 365 years, uh, days a, a year, and then doing a one volunteering program um, for a day. That's not servitude. Um, servitude is actually, in a way, more simple. Servitude is really a lifestyle. Servitude is a mindset. It's you 24-7, everywhere that you go, understanding that you have the power to change another person's life, to make another person's life a little better. So it could either be a second, you know, it could be a smile, it could be picking up a piece of rubbish, you know, but that is really servitude. But what that does is it gives us purpose. Right? It clarifies to us that we are, we are useful. Because we, all of us have an innate desire to be useful, to know that we have a purpose on this planet. And the minute you find that, then you find true happiness. And I guess that's something that's really greatly preached in Mind Valley. And the moment you have happiness, then you are in a state of flow. And when you're in a state of flow, you'll be able to get ideas just like that. And I mean, this is not my words, right? You can, you can go and scour uh, Mind Valley's website and you'll find loads of videos on why you need to be happy. But this is, this is, I guess, an easy way to find happiness and to find purpose. Two, creating collaborative advantage. Um, you've heard of, how many of you have heard of uh, competitive advantage? All right, so being from a social, um, from a social um, entrepreneur industry, we are all trying to do, to, to do good. It's surprising how a lot of times I go around and I, I meet different NGOs, I meet different charities. I find that so many of us are doing the same thing at the same time, in the same place, but without putting our, our, our forces together. And, and it's a shame, seeing that in this modern world, it is impossible, um, it's almost impossible to keep, to be um, competitive without sharing without collaborating. And, and in, order, in order to, do, to scale, in order to, to be competitive, or rather in its new form, collaborative, um, you need to know how to share. You need to know how to give. You need to learn um, how to receive. This is something that I learned in uh, my experience. That in this three to four years, I found that the more that I thought less about myself, and the more I thought of how I could help another person, the more help I, I got. The more support I got, the more funds I got, uh, the more ideas, solutions, the more people came to help. And, and I really believe that this is really the new way in moving forward. Um, level three. I think there's an error with the slides. My slides aren't showing up entirely, uh, but never mind. Uh, to level up. So in order to level up, a lot of times, we, we keep reaching higher. We take a lot of effort trying to reach higher. But what I found, what I, what I learned, that it wasn't about, it's not about trying to reach higher, it's about digging deeper. Every time it's time to level up, you got to dig a little deeper. What does that mean? That's, that means strengthening your character. That means not trying or acting uh, successful, but becoming the person that is to hold such success. Um, just to trace my journey from the start, where we did little projects and we asked for tens, uh, probably tens of thousands, or actually a thousand or five thousand. Um, we, I found that growth wasn't really a linear process. You don't go from one thousand, two thousand, three thousand, four thousand, and and you don't go that way. You know, it's. It's a very, very, it's a very exponential process. The problem about digging deeper is that it takes longer. However, when you dig deep and when you establish that roots, when you grow 
to that size, you're never going to, it's going to be hard to hit you down. The problem with that is that it's not very sexy. We want, we want um, instant results. You know, digging deep means you're just digging. No one sees it, right? Not even yourself. Sometimes you, you think that, you know, perhaps I'm not even doing anything. But so far, if you look, if I look at 2010, we built one house. And really, that was really just proving to ourselves that, hey, we managed to make this happen. This was a possible idea. Um, year 2011, uh, we realized that we needed a team. So we, I spent seven or eight months putting a team together, and somehow we couldn't find the right people, and that was a painful process. Um, and finally, when we had a team, we only built one house, but we built it um, without any professional labor. But still, it was just one house. It was really nothing to shout about. Um, but then, when we look at year 2012, following that one house, we built 12 houses. Um, we worked together. We got noticed by the Prime Minister's department. Um, we are currently looking at, they're currently looking at our solution um, of housing as, as, the, as the answer for this current problem with the Orang Asli uh, people. I got my opportunities as well, the level of the opportunities that I got kept growing, exponentially uh, grew. From 2010, meeting the Prime Minister, to 2013, um, representing Malaysia at the Commonwealth Day and meeting the Queen, uh, Queen Elizabeth. Is, um, at, at the Westminster Abbey at the Queen's Diamond Jubilee. You know, and, and, and I wasn't trying to reach for these things. But along the way, it, it was really about digging deep. But somehow, every time, um, every time I guess I was ready to take up that level, these things were thrown onto, onto me uh, and to the organization. So this year, we're looking at 25 houses, and we are potentially looking at... Um, so, the last, so last year, we were working with um, hundreds of thousands of uh, ringgit. But this year, we're looking at multi-million dollar projects that could possibly come true. It hasn't come true. But I believe that the time will come when we're ready. Right? Four, team. Um, create bonds of love right, in your team. So that's part of also digging deep. Um, one thing I learned last year with a lot of work was that I found myself um, getting very caught up with, with the work. I, I, it was, I, I, didn't do any, I didn't really have uh, intention, intentional focus on the people that were around me. Instead, we were all focusing on the work. And, and yes, we got houses built, but at the same time, I think a lot of friendships were shaken. Some friendships were lost. Um, and, and I realized a lot of people, people didn't really stay. People got demotivated. Um, and, and found out that that really wasn't a long-term solution. And so this year, actually, with the team, we decided to, to just take three months off. You know, stop trying to prove to ourselves that we can do this. Stop trying to, to impress people out there. Stop trying to just do work for the sake of doing work. But instead, to concentrate on each other, to get to know each other, uh, to play a couple of uh, ping pong in our office together. Um, and, and that has really helped. And, and, and the team, even though it's smaller than it was last year, we're stronger. And the kind of uh, things that we're going to do together and we're doing together are even bigger, even though we're less people. I believe that love is important in the, in the team to go beyond yourself, to be unselfish, because if you develop love or you make, you make your teammates love you or love each other, then you'll be going as far as dying for each other in, in achieving what you want to do together. And fifth, in leadership, lead honestly. Um, being a young social entrepreneur, being a social entrepreneur is ambiguous enough in Malaysia. There's no proper guidelines to being a social entrepreneur. Being a young entrepreneur as well is extremely intimidating. Um, there's so much to prove. You know, many people, when they look at you, you don't really have a, a huge track record. Um, and, and there are loads of people just looking up to you um, to lead, especially if you run an organization of your own. And if you want to be an entrepreneur, you will be running it. Uh, you'll probably be running or leading other people around you. 
And there's always this pressure to, to act like you know what you're doing, to, 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 to try to pretend that um, you're the best. And that was me back in 2012, and it was extremely tiring. We, I lost so much energy, so much sleep, so much, I had so much stress. Um, and what I realized was being honest with the team, trusting your team that they are following you because they know and understand who you are already. Um, and just being honest with them. When, at times where you don't know what you're doing, just say you don't know. Um, at times where you, know, you don't feel like you, you, you can do something, you have a team. You know? Just admit it. And I, I feel like um, that has really brought um, the team forward. And finally, have faith. So I said I'll give you five, but um, we're all in the business of giving, so I gave you six instead as a bonus. Um, have faith. So if you have a mindset of servitude where you constantly want to give value to people, um, if you... Man, I can't even remember my five slides. <laughs> Let me go back. If you look at co collaborating, constantly look at collaborating, if you look at leveling up by digging deeper, if you create bonds of love, and if you lead honestly, then all it takes is really a little faith and persistence. Just move forward, whether it's a CM, a mile, just keep moving. Just keep moving, and I promise you that good things will happen. And I believe that good things will happen to me as well. And I'm really, we're really in that process uh, of growth. We've done so much so far, as, as you can see, but it's still really not where we want to be. We want to go way further. And so I, I hope that, you know, I, I, I'm quite glad that I do not, I don't want to give you the impression that I've already made it. Um, but instead, I want you to understand that we're all in this process. And I, I guess that all of you are in this process as well. And hopefully you check back with me in, in about six months, you know, and, and if it works, then I'll put out the slides online and then you can, you can search for it. So that's all. Thank you very much.